Hello, everybody. I hope that we don't have any technical problems today. I welcome you to my house, and I'm very happy to be with you again. This is our third session, and remember that we do have a fourth one exactly a week from today. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with you so that we can all get started and talk about today's topic, the importance of student involvement when learning online. Uh, we have talked about how to uh, manage a class online. We've also talked about, obviously, how to teach in terms of the assessment for learning methodology. And we still have the evaluation process pending. But one of the key things about teaching online has to do with keeping those students involved as if they were in the classroom. And I would like to start with this quote from a very famous person that maybe many of you have read about, John Dewey. He is a contemporary of Jean Piaget. And together, one of the reasons why I uh, admire his and their work in general is because I consider myself a cognitivist and John Dewey and Jean Piaget were the cognitivists of their time. Okay, If you look carefully, it says give pupils something to do, not something to learn. The message is very clear. It's not about just presenting content to students. It is about having them act upon it, do things. We know that, especially when we teach young learners, it is crucial that our students are busy doing things. Think, speak, do, okay? So when, it's, when we are teaching online, the doing part becomes a little challenging. Now, and the doing, John Dewey continues telling us, is of such a nature as to demand thinking. This means not just do for the sake of doing, see? because a lot of teachers, uh, I remember when I studied to be a teacher, uh, a lot of, of my classmates, my fellow future teachers, were concerned about singing songs and doing all these crazy things, but you have to teach something of substance as well. So something in, in cognitivism, we want the students to think as they do things, not just to work in a mechanical way. So the doing is of such a nature as to demand thinking or the intentional noting of connections. And that noting of connections means that the students are supposed to link what we present them with other things that they are learning or that they know. And we've all heard of the concept of prior knowledge. And the reason why I, I talked about Jean Piaget a minute ago is because one of the key things that Jean Piaget contributed to learn, to the understanding of how a human being should learn is that Jean Piaget talked to us about the principles of assimilation, what the teacher presents, and the accommodation of what the teacher presents, the way the students understand it, they accommodate it here. But in order for a student to accommodate, there needs to be something there, something what we call prior knowledge. So that is why this is a beautiful quote, the intentional noting of connections, learning naturally results. Yes, because you just add to what you have. Now, having said that, and remember that I can send you this because uh, you might want to have this uh, with you. Uh, obviously, the correct teaching strategies and structures are those that engage students in many ways. So we want the student to be hands-on, we want them to be interactive, and we want them to generate concepts. But all that in a way that the students become good critics, in other words, that they can establish conclusions, they can judge, see? In any subject, regardless if it's English or not, the highest level of learning is when someone can establish conclusions, when someone can create concepts. In the mental process, then that's where we use the word critique. It's not criticizing as in the neighborhood, okay, or fashion. It is about judging, concluding on things, constructing concepts. That's why it's called constructivism. And there, my friends, lies 
the learning process. When someone can take something that he or she assimilates and turns it into something that they can use to establish their thoughts, to conclude on things, to produce knowledge in a way that they, they're doing it by getting involved in a meaningful thing. Now, the word meaningful is crucial here because what we want from the student is to understand before anything else. Those of us that have met before may, might have heard me, those of you that have met me before might have heard me say that the basic thing of a class is to make sure, especially in an English class, is to make sure that students understand meaning. If they don't understand meaning, then there's no purpose for going on. So in the classroom, then by, be, by taking the concept to higher levels, then students are actually teaching each other. See? They are developing new knowledge and their teacher is with them as part of a, as a co-learner because how many times have our students asked for something or contributed something that we ourselves didn't know? It's a learning process and that's what makes teaching interesting because we're not supposed to just be repetitors of what we already know, but open-minded to receive new concepts and work them with our students. Now, because the teachers are following the principles of assessment for learning, the ones we discussed on our first class two weeks ago, then what happens is that the students are continuously analyzing things, synthesizing, putting things together. So that, that is what the teacher is always busy doing. So as you walk around your classroom, all smiles and happiness, what you really are, what your mind is really doing is analyzing and synthesizing, putting things together in a way that your students will be taken in an organized way through the lesson that you have planned for them. Now, uh, obviously, a question is what if we have to do it online, which is of course our statement today. Well, we have to keep that interaction and that generative nature of the students alive and well, and that is the problem. So we want them to continue being an engine that can allow them to get involved, interact, of course, and do the criticizing, the, the summarizing that I was telling about the construction in a very proactive way. And that, my friends, is what this session explores today. What options do we have to keep this student involved, even if all he has is like you, a computer frame in front of him? Well, let's take a look at that, see? The first thing that we need to use in our favor is to have an independent learner. If our learners are not independent learners, then we are going to have a problem. If the pandemic had happened before uh, modern methodology had come to be, then we would have more dependent learners than independent learners, and we would be struggling even more than what we are struggling. Dependent learners don't do well online because they need to be guided, they need to be taken. Now, that doesn't mean independent learners don't need to be guided. Of course, that's what that's our job. That's where we make the big money, okay? No, it is the way that we lead them, see? Uh, it is not for the teacher to choose them. Everybody has to be independent. So then the way we teach is thinking, or take it into consideration that we have an independent learner across from us. Now, if they are not independent yet, then we have to affect them in that level as we go along. And you know, just the way it happens in many things, the first time you do it, it doesn't work as better or as well as it will work the next time. Same thing here, okay? Uh, your students don't dismay if on the first during the first month you say like, oh my God, October will be different. Okay. Now, the teachers, you have to design certain kind of activities that allow the students to work on their own. So as you plan your classes, think, what can I do with my class? 
that the students can work on their own, okay? Because that's what it's gonna have, wind up being. And you want your students to be responsible. You want them to be independent because their scenario is an independent scenario. Unless they have a, a brother or sister that is in the same grade that they are, they are sitting there alone facing their needs. Now, of course, the teacher needs to know how to design these activities. So we will, we're going to talk about that today. See? We want you to be able to design activities all the way from carrying on unsupervised things because you cannot keep your eyes open enough. You cannot supervise everything. But then how can you teach right if you cannot supervise everything? Well, there is a caveat a little condition, okay, that the activities that you ask your students to do should not be very challenging to assess. In other words, don't ask them to do to activities that are too difficult for you to see if they carry them out well. Otherwise, they won't, and you won't know, and your class loses formality. So be very wise in choosing the levels that you do with your students. How do we keep independent learners involved? Okay, see, I focused on independent learners. Now, how do you keep them involved? Well, the first thing you want to do is that you want to segment your classes in shorter sections, shorter sequences. Don't teach very big things from start to, to end. And we saw this last week, for those of you that attended, do some teaching and then wrap things up a bit, see? Regularly check comprehension by asking quick questions. So go with your students, go with them. It, it participate, intervene more than before. And uh, as you progress in your teachings, keep asking questions about what you just said. Bring all of them together with you, see? Make sure that students understand or have understood the key points in each of those short segments. If normally you have a story and you read the whole page, this time read a paragraph and ask questions. Go to the next paragraph and ask questions. Go to the next paragraph and ask questions. You see what I'm coming, where I'm coming from? Shorter segments. Now, remember to keep the interaction going. So don't leave it as the student is there, and you're reading or they are reading. No, keep the interaction going. Ask questions that they will have to raise their hand. Show something, a card, a paper. Keep them involved. Remember, doing is crucial in this involvement part. And always give examples of what you want them to say or how you want them to say it. Always give examples. Use your gestures, your tone of voice, as we discussed on lesson number, uh, class number one two weeks ago. Use your gestures. This is where you're going to use your face. You got that pretty face you got? This is the time to use it, okay? Smile and keep going. But of course, what you're pursuing is for students to understand, not just understand. See, there are two understandings going on the language and uh, what are how are we doing this okay. because they don't have anybody to, next to them that will explain things to them now another thing we can do to keep those independent learners is to maximize access to material last week we talked about tutorial videos we talked about emails that come and go okay so give your students as much access to materials as possible what really matters is that students are always involved. Now, you want to assign offline tasks. Remember that last, for those of you that attended last week, and if those of you that didn't, well, send me an email so I can send you the transparencies. Uh, remember that I talked about the fact that there was a before teaching online, before going online, when we were online and after online? This is it. The before and the after is this is when you assign activities offline for preparation so that they can engage and be ready the moment this thing begins. You always want, obviously, they're not always going to have access to their phone. Maybe the, your students are sharing a computer at home and it becomes a very desired commodity because 
a lot of their siblings also need to go online to take their own courses. So then try to assign things that they can incorporate to their doing without having to be looking at their computer or hogging the computer for more time. Think about that, okay? This is when you can assign them things to do in their notebooks or to do things in, on paper and take photos and later email them to you, that kind of thing. Now, when students bring their schoolwork into the real world, see, obviously they bring it to school. But what they are doing is they are practicing self-directed learning, okay? What you are doing with them, and we want to continue doing this, is you want them to develop certain skills that have to do with working on their own. Because in real life, students, people are on their own. The teacher eventually detaches like a parent, and then the students are on their own. Now, when you plan your classes, always ask yourselves this key question. Is there an activity there? Are there enough situations where my students are going to be asked to be creative? Remember, in the modern learning process, linguistics is one third of the pie. Learning strategies and skills are the second third of the pie. But the last third of the pie, is the emotional part of learning. So if you don't call for creativity, you are not doing what you need to do for that last third of the pie. And that, my friends, is sad because as good as you might do with the other stuff, you are not, you will never get to 100% because 33% is not even in play. Have everything in play. See how much sticks, but be very cautious. Always call for creativity. The more you set up your students to being creative, the more attentive they will be, the more involved they will be, even when they are not looking at you on screen, even when they are doing their work at home. Now, so this means that we want to keep these students involved by being creative, by shortening our teaching sections, by always keeping them busy with their hands. But there are two categories of activities to keep in mind when we want our students involved on a, in a, with an online class. Two categories, two, very broad by the way, okay? The first category has to do with when the students are sitting in front of their screens participating in class. So one of the things we will look at today is how do I keep my, or we're starting to look at is, how do I keep my students busy, involved, when they are with me? But then the other category, and yes, you guessed it, the other category, category number two is, what about when the session is not over per se, but the session is over, but not the lesson. It means that there, which means that there are still things to do, just they're not going to do them like with you. They still have to finish up things on their own as independent learners. So those are the two broad categories that we will next visit. Now, the first one, when they are with you online, well, there's a situation. You need to present a new concept, you need to teach them. So the best way to present a concept is by showing examples and describing the examples. Throw words into your examples because the students are going to need more support. Let's, let's, let's practice, okay? I, those of you that know me from workshops know that I like to keep people busy. So let's practice something today. Let's explore the possibilities of involving students when taught online using a reading activity. Let's, let's teach a reading class today together. Okay. Now, this is a reading activity from my series, Big English, level three, third grade. But you can do this with big fun, kindergarten. You could do it with older, uh, even secondary, if that uh, might be your scenario. The analysis that follows the story will be more useful if we read it first. So here it goes. We ask the students to read the story. And then when we start the class fresh, we read it together. So 
Children, let's read the story. Amy is ready. I'm ready for my hike. I have my hiking boots, water, and snacks. Amy is happy. Today, her class is going on a hike. See what I'm doing there? I'm using the concluding statement. I'm using the caption as conclusion. We can also use it as an introductory statement. I'm going to use that for the second case. Mom doesn't think Amy is ready. And then I do the dialogue. So concluding, introductory. I'm talking about the captions. Wait a minute, you need your raincoat and umbrella. Why? What's the weather like? Is it rainy? Mom doesn't want Amy to get wet. No, not right now. But what was the weather like yesterday? It was rainy. Uh, Amy recalls here. She doesn't want Amy to get cold. And last night, it was cold and windy. Take your sweater and your hat and gloves too. Okay. But mom, it's warm and sunny today. Sunny? Oh, then take your sunglasses and sunscreen too. Amy isn't worried about the weather. Now you're ready. Amy is ready for all kinds of weather. Even if the students were asked to read it at home as a before going online, we do it together because there's always a question, there's always someone who didn't do it, who forgot, who this or who that. While the students are sitting in front of their screens participating in class is the first category, remember? So let's live, let's teach together this reading class. See, we're making it as practical as possible. I have developed four categories of entries. The involvement concept, what the teacher does, what the student, how the student gets involved, and how the teacher concludes how well they did, the teacher assessment. So let's take a look. See, I'm gonna obviously we start with involving our students. So students must follow the presentation of the story, just what you did with me right now. See? I'm I I'm not that stupid. I know what I'm doing. I just did the, the left side column with you, okay? In order to cover the basics, which are to understand its meaning. This means that I could ask questions right now. Did everybody have a teacher? What did it, whatever, okay? And then the teachers, this is what the teacher does. Ta-da! This is where you put your best paying face. And you, that's why it's, it's in quotations. So look how, how, how to detail I went. I'm even telling you exactly what to do. This story is about when, so here I am with a book, okay, showing it to the screen. This story is about the weather and clothes. As we can see, Amy is talking to her mother. We are going to role play. I want you to decide if you want to be Amy or her mother. Show me, it, well, I want you to decide if you want to be Amy or her mother. Show me Amy's. And so you're looking at your students, and the students are supposed to go, show me moms. Now, what is the first problem we have here? Both Amy and the mother are female. And if you work in a regular school, you have a mixed class. So then what is our challenge here? To remind our students that they are playing roles, okay? So where is the student involvement? So then the teachers raise a hand, when the, this is what the, this is the pr the product of the student student involvement the student raises raise a hand students raise a hand when he or she hears amy or mom depending on the chosen role so the reaction the involvement is to do this what will the teacher know how do you know you have to assess this activity how do you assess it look at the last column eyes on screen making sure everybody raised their hand once. Okay? So the first target is to make sure that everybody has accepted a role. Now, so the teacher speaks, the student gets involved, and the teacher checks to see if it was done or not. Now, we keep going. We're still while we're doing it in the classroom. 
full, what are we going to involve our students in now? We're going to involve them in full body involvement by role playing, acting out. So the teacher says, you can also act out your role. See? So don't be shy and be who you chose to be. Why am I emphasizing this with an exclamation mark? The reason why I'm doing it is because, remember what I said earlier about your class having male students as well? In some countries, there are male classes altogether, okay, no girls. So then you want them to see that they are role playing, that that's what people do because they are acting. And what, how does the student show involvement? Well, it's visually noticeable through gestures that he or she is reading and acting out. Oh, put on, you need the umbrella. Oh, but put on a sweater. Oh, oh, you, the sun, you're gonna need sunglasses and some, okay, some block too. And the students are acting out the whole thing. Okay? They act out what the character is saying. Teachers can ask students to permanently have like a, now one thing that you could do, and I've done this many times, some of you have seen me actually do it. Uh, I, have, I, I cut these like bands of cardboard, okay, like stripes of cardboard, bands or stripes. And then I cut them top and bottom so they can hook up like this in a way that they form like a crown. And on the front, I stick on with tape, with masking tape, different things. In this case, the students can have, uh, remember that we were talking the other day about um, avatars or things of that sort? Well, the students can, can be playing the role of the mother or Amy, and they could have their drawing of Amy or something that you sent me and they colored, that you sent them, sorry, and they colored. So remember, they can stick different post-its or they can use just post-its on it. No, no glue, no, no tape, just the poster if they have access to those things with the different roles that they have the opportunity to play during the course. So all the student needs is one headband. Remember, it's just cardboard. You cut up half of it from the top on one side half of it from the bottom on the other side, and then you, they just hook up like this. And you have a crown, and then you just put things on the front. Well, who's gonna be able to see the thing that's uh, glued or stuck or whatever on the front? You are, okay. like this, because it's gonna be here, just like you're looking at my hand right now, okay? And then of course, how does the teacher assess this? Well, either you leave all mics open, and then you hear them as a class as you would hear them in the classroom. Because in the classroom, we cannot mute students. Here you can. Have you ever thought about that? In the classroom, wouldn't it be great if you could just go bing and, and, and someone could just go okay? So then here you can, but sometimes you wanna let them all shower you with their nice voices. Okay. And, or you can mute a few and unmute just, or mute them all and then unmute a few so that you can go at, to see if, how they're miming and see if you understand what they're saying and listen to their uh, intonation and pronunciation. Now, another thing we're doing, we're still in the first category, okay? We want, now it's time to monitor. And remember, for those of you that didn't attend our first class two weeks ago, we go in assessment for learning as a method. We go through involving and then we monitor. And the purpose of monitoring is to see that the students have got it, to see that there is no gap between what you are pursuing as an objective and what they are showing you they can do. Of course, the gap is going to be there many times. That's perfectly natural. But this is not the moment to close the gap. This is the moment to define, to identify. So the teacher is going to monitor, and the, the concept is that we want the students to show understanding visually, using body and cards and things, okay? Because we're asking them to role play. Now, what does the teacher say? Well, let's give you a mic, okay? Look at the questions and activities. So remember, you have the book there. The students are looking at their books at home. Look at the questions in activity six. 
show me your number card according to the question I read. What I did is I asked my students to have numbers one through five because there are five questions on this or after the reading or monitoring. So remember what I said in short segments of keeping everybody, bringing all the little chicks with you? Okay. Well, this is the way you do it. You have your students have cards or post-its one through five, and then the teacher will read a card. Well, I'm sorry, we'll read a question and the students, if they are not paying attention, they won't know if it's number one, number two, number three, number four, number five. Okay. So you read a question and the students go, the teacher is reading number three. And what are you doing? Two things you're doing. You're keeping them involved because they're doing something. And not only are you keeping them involved, but they are giving you feedback for understanding purposes, which is the purpose of monitoring. You see how it all makes sense? This is why I always say that teaching is a beautiful thing because although sometimes it might be a little complicated, the truth of the matter is that it is beautiful. It's beautiful. One of the things I love about education is that if we do it right, it all makes sense. See, if somebody explains things to us as how to teach, it all makes sense and you want to do it because it sounds fun as well. Now, as I do this, what are the students going to be doing, I said? Well, they are going to be showing the number cards, one through five, depending on which question the teacher is reading. So the students do this and they listen to the question. And then of course, the way the teacher can assess this to see if there is a gap or not, is that the teacher looks at the screens to see if everybody is showing the card with the right number. Remember, you should use a platform that allows you two ways of dealing with your students. All together, even if they're all crumbled up there, packed in, on your screen, and at the same time, or in sections if you can't put all of them there, and at the same time, a way that you could get rid of all of them and just look at the screen that you are building in front of you. So remember that that is what we want to achieve. But the students should have their books and sometimes they can contribute by typing things. Not, a, not every platform allows us to do that. The students can write on notebooks and put it in front. They can use markers. They can use red and black markers, dark blue, in ways that they are more visually appealing and easily to, distinct, to differ, differentiate. So we, we get our little tricks there. Now, we're still with number one. Remember that we have two categories. Remember that? See what I'm doing? I'm bringing back everything from the past. And then, of course, uh, we want to involve our students in the monitor. We're not done with the monitoring. So now we show knowledge of information. What we want is the students to show us because what we're doing is seeing if they were involved. We, we were monitoring their involvement. Now let's monitor their knowledge. Okay. Show knowledge of information by pointing at it where it's written. This means that the teacher is going to grab the mic and say, I'm going to ask you, remember that, five questions and point at the correct answers in the speech bubble. And you can see. So then the students will raise the books to the camera and they will point at where the, remember that there were six little pictures, little illustrations with the, with the, uh, the comic strip? Well, the students will go to the one raises book to camera and points at the text that answer the questions correctly. Now, how does the teacher, how can the teacher know if they are finding the answer at the same time that they say it and you're keeping them busy? Well, the way you can check it is by skimming and scanning. See? You do this, you go, and of course, you see if everybody is pointing at the text. Now, something very interesting happens here. Because the information is in different picture, on different pictures, you will you will learn who isn't doing it right by the process of elimination. Remember, one of the beautiful things about visual, about visualizing, is that it is a sense that immediately allows us to judge what we are seeing. Uh, this is where, of course, 
uh, we always take advantage of this beautiful sense that we have as human beings. See, Re notice that magazines have these like these differences and like spot five differences. And what do we do? We look very fast at the two pictures until we see that one of them has a watch and the other one doesn't. Why do you think that was invented? Who came up with that idea? Well, somebody that realized that visualization is very powerful because you immediately tell the difference if you look at two things. So when the teacher asks to find the information, because the information can come in six different places, it is so easy by elimination, by looking at the one, that, the pointing that doesn't look similar to the other 20, okay? It's easier, it's, it's easier to see who didn't find it than those that did. I hope I'm explaining myself. It's going to look very awkward. It's like if you say, show me a green paper and you see 30 papers and two are red, those are the ones that are gonna draw your attention, not the 28 green ones. Okay. You immediately know how they did. And the same thing happens with this here. Now, when you assist your students, remember, involve, monitor, assist, so now we're in the third stage of the cognitive process of assessment for learning. When you assist your students in this story class, reading class, you want to confirm knowledge of meaning in a physical, playful way. Yes, physical, playful. Remember, our common denominator today is keeping students involved. So physical allows for involvement. Playful really allows for involvement. So what does the teacher say? Everybody stand up in front of your camera. Imagine that. <sighs> Yippee, okay. I'm going to play the audio for the story. And I want you to follow along. Mind me what you hear. <sighs> yeah, yeah, okay. So then you say, you're gonna need an umbrella. And whoever's playing mom is doing, you're gonna need an umbrella and a sweater. And you start passing things around. And those that are playing mom are, are do, grabbing the things like, okay. Now, see what I just did? When I grabbed the sweater, I did, oh, okay. And I put it in my bag. I'm a smart teacher. Why am I not just, a sweater can just be grabbed. But because they are role playing, we're not seeing the sweater. Okay. So then you have to play. This is why you are the one making money there. Your students are paying to be with you. You go, okay. So you grab the sweater, you see it. And where does the sweater go? For the time being, on your back. And then with the umbrella. Okay. And you see gloves. Yeah. Oh, they still fit. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you you have them give you more because you want to be able to see that they are busy, they're physically involved, busy, and then of course it's playful because you are acting it out as if you were there. Smart teachers. And then of course students are going to stand in front of the camera and listens and reacts mindfully. Just what I said. But what about you? You come back. See, this is the difference between a a hardworking teacher and a professional teacher. A professional teacher knows this last column or comes up or something. See, a, a good teacher will do what I just said so far. Let's act it out. You're, you're good, you're busy. Mother Superior loves you and she doesn't want you to go to another school. But a professional teacher checks there are no noises just doing miming that matches the audio play so you go beyond and of course obviously we want you to be a professional teacher now challenge remember that we have four stages plus one and our fourth stage before the plus one is a challenge so how do we challenge what we just did well, students must show alertness, paying close attention for a fast response. Challenges always have to uh, go for something extra, see? Not the fact that they know it, not the fact that they can say it, not the fact that they can act it out. No, challenge them now maybe with being fast 
or being the ones that find more or the ones that can come up with more. See, challenges are supposed to go beyond the normal, beyond the basic, beyond the expectations that we all have. So the teacher grabs the mic. I'm joking. The teacher keeps speaking. We are going to play a game. And the moment the students hear that, yay, even the baby in the crib at home says, did I hear a game, everybody? Okay, so let's see if your speakers are working fine. I'm going to say someone's name, da -da 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 -da, and that person will say the text of the story. Let's start reading. Okay. Let's start. Mary. And Mary starts with the first, like, uh, oh, I'm ready to go. For, I'm ready for my hike. Okay. And before this, Mary came, the teacher changes in, I don't know how many students you have, but I'm sure there are a lot of them. So then you change to another one, George. And, uh, so then well, how is it? So George has to follow exactly after the word, the last word that Mary read. What are you doing? You're keeping them on the edge of their chairs. That's what the challenge is. So then this, Mary, I'm ready for my hike. I have George, I have my hiking boots on. Now it's it. <laughs> Until you write, and you can come back to Mary and George. They're not supposed to think that they're that they are done with, you, or you're done with them. Okay. Now, how does the, the professional teacher assess? You see that everybody is prompt and prepared to intervene when called. So if you're looking at the screen, do you see someone like ah, or disappearing from the front of the screen? Or are you call them that? It's just that wonderful thing. I just love it. Now. Uh, another challenge, because we like, if we challenge, we like to challenge, don't we? Social opinion, social discussion. In other words, we're taking it to the students' lives. Make students' ideas count. So the teacher says, you know, in a very, um, like, philosophical, you say, why do you think Amy's mother is so protective? Yeah, you play your role, you act, uh, Remember, teachers are actors. We are actors, okay? Let's face it. Uh, we make more than movie stars, but we are also actors like they are. Okay. So then, why do you think you can you give it a feeling? Why do you think Amy's mother, why do you think Amy's mother is so protective? What clothes should she take? Notice how I emphasize on the should she take, meaning, of all the list, which ones should she take? Okay, so the student and the students get involved. They discuss. I think if it's not really cloudy out there, well, why take the umbrella? And is she going to be outside? It's a, is it a picnic? Oh, it's a hike. Yeah, she should take the sunblock. You know, teacher, how do you say? And then the student asks a question and you provide them with the answer. If you know it, if you don't, you don't, period. Okay? And you, you look it up. You can, you, can have, you can have your phone on the side and look it up, or you just bluntly tell them to look it up. End of story, okay? Now, professional teacher assessment. Well, this what the teacher does is you allow some students to express their opinion to the group. So you say, okay, George, and you open his mic, and George starts saying, I think she doesn't have to take the sweater because I think it's the summer. So it might rain, but it's not really going to be cold. Or it was in the night. Is she coming? That, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, it includes subtopic as part of the independent work activities. What do we mean by a subtopic as part of the independent work activities? Well, we can take it from here into the students producing something. Like I can tell them to draw Amy and put on her the things that they would want her to take to the height and not include the things that they don't think she should take. So it becomes a subtopic of a major topic. Or you can even turn it into a value regarding listening to parents and parents knowing better. Now we're on two. Now we're going for, ooh, not that much time left. My God, this time flies. 
Uh, now we're going for the the per, the after the session, but before the lesson is over per se. Curse you can you can uh, you can offer them the corresponding PowerPoints or the videos that you did. Remember that we were talking about tutor, tutorial videos that go with each topic, uh, self-made videos or things that you want them to do online. So the teacher can have, tell them, okay, everybody, uh, tonight I want you to watch the extension video at, and you tell them or you show them or they already have it or you send it an email. The student files worksheets, let's say, or, the, or you know, like the workbook that they did, they take a picture of the page or the special worksheet that they downloaded or you sent them. That's what I mean by downloading. And then they, now they take a picture and they file it. Remember that we talked last week about keeping a file for students and for parents later on. And the teacher's assessment is that you view the work. Notice what I'm saying here. I am not saying teachers check the work or, or mark the work. Teachers view work. You cannot keep up with so much thing. You cannot print everybody's work. You keep those files and you only print the things that are of your interest that are convenient for your class as a teacher. Now, um, another category is classroom topic related extensions. This means that we extend the topic to something else. The teacher says, summarize what you learned today. Okay. So you ask them to do something. This is after class, like, like uh, home, not homework, but homework because they're already home. Okay. Uh, summarize what you learned today. Search places with bad weather. And the student will come back with Alaska, will come back with Russia, and take notes about those places. So the students do it. They file Alaska, a place with a permanent winter, or whatever they want to call it, and share the file with the teacher. And what does the teacher do? The teacher views the work. Some of them you will discuss later. Now, you, you can have them do reflections, give you feedback. So the teacher asks, what doubts do you have about today's class? What was the thing you liked the most? The, students, the student thinks about the class and goes over it mentally. Hmm, the sweaters, I don't like sweaters. I like this or I like hoodies. Or, which means he or she stays connected with the topic. And the student can register answers and of course upload them. And the teacher starts the next class asking about this to receive feedback. So the next day you start your class and you tell them, so what was the thing you liked most about our, our story that we read uh, yesterday or the day before yesterday? And the students start little by little giving you some feedback just for the time that you can allot for them and allow. Now, you can keep a log, see, you can, the teacher tells, the, you can ask the student to keep a log, not, not your log, their log as well, which is the one you will get. Register the words you learned today. So the students can have like a vocabulary card set. Uh, set. And they can, today I learned these words. So then they write them and the pack of cards, the deck of cards keep getting, keeps getting bigger and bigger. And they can, they can type them and send you their lists and they can share them, it becomes a lot of fun. Student adds new and other words of interest to the vocabulary log, adds vocabulary cards to the school year collection, because you can create a school year, the student has a school year collection and then you can turn it into a classroom collection and you can do a ton of things with those words. Put them in sentences, uh, use them to talk, uh, use them for writing, for composition, draw a word out. It, there, it's unthinkable, the amount of things that you can do. And then, of course, the teacher's assessment periodically. Let's, you can decide if it's going to be every week or every two weeks, or you ask for files, the collection, for viewing, or see, now I added the word revision. So you can tell them at the end of each month, send me your vocabulary log so far, and they will they will give you an update. So you will see the one that they added in September and the one they added in October and so on and so forth. Now, uh, another concept is personal expression. Remember, we want them to you want to keep them busy. This is about involvement. 
So you they want you want them to talk, but you also want them to ex to express themselves, not just orally. So you can have out of class projects, assignments that differentiate individual from group work. So the teacher can say, how can you use the information you learned today? Did, did anything have a special meaning to you? Yes, I like hiking. Or no, when I was a little kid, I fell. I went hiking with my father and I fell down and I burst my knee. And I don't like that. So did anything have a special meaning to you? Well, the student writes or draws about today's content. Shares file with a teacher, posts work on site so the whole school can see it, takes pictures of work, and uploads them. And how did the teacher check this? Periodically, periodically, you ask for files for viewing or revision. So, oh, is this the last class of September already? You already know, but you're pretending, right? Uh, so everybody, before the beginning of October, I want to see everybody's projects. They take if they are 3D, just take a pic, put them on top of your dining table, and take a picture of them. Okay, and label whatever it is you want to you want them to be described by, and then take pictures and, and upload them. Okay, and the te the teacher uses the final products for pin boards. Then you can construct a pin board like the ones in Pinterest. Okay, you can you can create a pin board. So find a place in your house where you could have like an area that is not used by uh, like a picture or a painting, or you can clear your dining room table and put like, uh, if you don't want to use paper, you can put a, a, a bed sheet on top of it. And then on top of that, you put the different pictures that the students send you. And you can take another picture of the whole thing and you can expand it and it can become like a pin board that you can exhibit for the school to see or for online postings or for the students to have feedback of everybody. See, there is a class culture and community. So you want them to feel that they are a community. So students, students and school families communication network. Even though they are learning online, you want the students to feel that they belong. Remember, one of the beautiful things about a school is the sense of belonging. See? Students need to know that they are part of something. Just the way they are part of their family, they are part of a class. So the teacher says something like this. This afternoon, check your closet and list three garments you have you could wear in the winter and three you could wear in the summer. So the people go, you are personalized. Okay. And then send your list to your teammates before 6 p.m. Please remember, if this is the week you have to summarize everybody's work and send it to me before bedtime, because the students are going to be taking turns. Every week, one a different one is going to be the summarizer. That's why it says before 6 p.m., because the, the summarizer has before bedtime or before 10 or before dinner, however you want to measure things up. So the students at home checks the closet and lists garments, forwards the list to the week's team leader. And the team leader consolidates lists and forwards the product to the teacher. You see, lots of involvement. Yeah. And how do you evaluate this? How do you assess it? Well, by levels of socialization. How integrated are they? You check that lists arrive from the team leaders. You keep an eye on that. But most importantly, you check to see if they are functioning as members of something. Why am I saying that they should do it through teams? Because of socialization. Remember, when they are learning online, it is a very dangerous, uh, let's say there is potential for them losing this beautiful thing called socialization, particularly because the reason why they are taking classes online is because of a pandemic, which means that even if they are not with you, they aren't socializing either. So we as teachers have to find a way of doing it. Now, so what is the role of parents in this involvement thing? Well, parents could be your greatest ally in this new normal, see? 
you can connect with them early and help them send home assignments. Like all those before things, if you have a good school where parents are involved, you can send them. When I say good, I mean participating school. I mean involved parents. I don't mean good as in they charge a lot of money. Believe me, I've seen I've seen in my share of schools in the world. Okay, so some of them might charge a lot of money, and the parents don't even care about their kids. Okay? So what I mean by a good school, I should have said a good educational community. Okay, that's a good school. And if 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 you can rely on them, then you can send them stuff. See, so you, they can share their login info. And then if there's any platforms that the students are going to, the parents can also go there and see what's happening and look at their students' work and see what kind of resources the kids need. There's a lot of stuff that parents can do if we make them be part of it. It's better to over-communicate than under-communicate. Even if they say, oh my God, there's the English teacher again, that's better than if they say, huh, are you taking an English course? Haven't heard from your teacher. Ugh. Okay. Like everybody else, parents are overwhelmed. Yes, they are suffering the economic situation. And many of them, not only are they, are they overwhelmed because of the other factors, but also because they are not teachers. So now we ask them to support their families with less income. And at the same time, we ask them to support us by helping their students a lot. That is a big burden over their shoulders. So many of them feel that they are not worthy of it. They feel that they are ill-equipped to support their child's learning growth. So let's make them feel useful. Make them feel that they have a role and that there is involvement as well. When you make it clear that you are there to support them, see, you have to be their pillar. Tell them, don't worry. Any question you have, give me a call or send me an email. That's even better. Okay. Uh, to support them in any way you can. And of course, they will more likely uh, to be, they, they will be more likely to become active participants in their child's learning. Turn it into a win-win situation. You have them involved and the students learn more. It's a win-win case, isn't it? So then my friends, it's time for me to answer your questions, okay? Here we go. Let me see, I have a question. What can I do with students who don't care at all? Well, start by talking to their parents, okay? Uh, so then, uh, in order to have a, a creative class involving students, I've used more apps during this pandemic than ever before in my life. I believe you, so have I, so have I, okay? But yes, your first, your first way of getting involved, of, with, of getting those students that don't care is knowing or having their parents know, okay? And then start sending them personalized notes. Send them emails that are personalized so they feel that they, see, I, I know that we're that we're already out of time, but I'm gonna keep speaking. I hope you can stay for a while. Um, hope they don't cut us off. But this is very important. Uh, I always use, because of your question, I always use an analogy that are y'all, do you think that I would be wearing this shirt? I'm, you can see I'm in my house, okay? You think I would be wearing this well-pressed shirt if it hadn't been for the fact that I'm going to speak to you? Of course not. I would have a wonderful, comfy uh, T-shirt on, you know, doing my thing, working on next Wednesday's presentation, maybe drinking some soda. But because I'm going to be the speaker, I, like, up my act a bit. Well, this is a psychological principle that you can carry on to your students. Make them feature. And the moment they feature, they will become more involved because they will know that they have responsibilities to look up to and to perform. And that's, it's like putting them on top of the stove. They will cook. <laughs> and I'm not talking to the students, I'm talking about the group. Now, all these suggestions about the cards are fit for high school? Yes, they are. Now, just make it more, see, this is where you have to, we have to use our intelligence. For secundaria or high school or junior high or whatever you call it in your country of origin, uh, what do you do? You turn those cards into something more representative of the generation. 
you can have them ask them to have five different cards of teams of soccer teams or uh, five different singers and see which are like the billboard. So if they show, uh, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm from the Madonna years, but I don't know. If they show, who's out there now, I can't remember. Uh, if they show, oh, uh, what's her name? The, uh, the Italian girl, uh, Lady Gaga. If they show Lady Gaga, then that means they're showing a one, okay? If they, sh you see my point? If they show Maluma or whomever, whomever is out there, uh, so you just play the psychology of the age group. If you don't feel that you know enough about their age group, read about it. It won't take you a morning. See? And you will learn to level with them. The task is to have them show something. It doesn't have to be a number one. It could be a picture of something. See? Um, how long could this session last following all these steps? You have it. If your classes are 50 minutes, 50 minutes. Your classes are an hour, an hour. Your classes are an hour 20, an hour 20. See, my class is an hour. I'm already reading questions. When I'm going to do this for China, they gave me 90 minutes. It's going to take me 90 minutes. See? It's called professionalism. Um, let's see. How about a visual portfolio? Oh, yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. Which site or tool do you recommend? Well, I don't necessarily recommend a, a site because you can just use the cloud. See, if you have access to the cloud, use your own cloud. Have them as, uh, on on your on, the, on your uh, what do you call this on your desktop. Uh, have a file for each of the classes you teach, and every time something arrives, just drag it in there, drag it in there, drag it in there. And then eventually you can form your, your files inside a file and you keep everything luxuriously set and organized. And, uh, and then you turn that. One of the things I do is I'm just telling you stuff you could do. Like when you want to show stuff to other people, stuff that you received, open PowerPoint. You're not going to show a PowerPoint presentation. You're going to use PowerPoint as a platform. So you open the transparency, you drop everything you want on it, you write the text you want on it, whatever it is that you want to show, because the, the beautiful thing about using PowerPoint, I use Keynote for Mac, but let's say that you don't have a Mac, then PowerPoint will too. And then you put up, you can write text, you can change the color, you, you, can, you can edit it as much as you want. That's why I'm recommending PowerPoint, not Word. PowerPoint. You can move things around, okay? And then once it's the way you want it, you have a screenshot, a picture. Now, you don't even have to use your phone. Your, your computer will give you, uh, I think it's like F4 or something like that. It'll give you a screenshot. And then you take that screenshot and you extend it as much as you want. You want to print it, extend it to a double letter size. You want to send it, you send it as a, you turn it into a PDF, you turn it into a PNG. Whatever format works for your school, you don't even need a platform. Just use your cloud, and it just you know to save more information. Um, can I modify them? Of course, you can modify the stories and send them to me so I can share them with other teachers. What if they don't hide or they don't really care about the story? Well, that's something that you need to consider. The stories don't have to be about what they can do. It's called learning about the world. It's called 21st century skill, global awareness. Student, not because I don't know how to swim, I'm not going to watch swimming in the Olympics. Think about that, see, it's expanding. It doesn't have to be something that they do, but you can change it to something that they do if you want, but don't shy away from it because they have to do it. No, you don't have to, we're learning. Uh, now, what about your English lab activities? Is that enough for a work offline? It could be, but if you can ask for more, see, there is a saying in many countries that it doesn't cost to ask. So take your students to a different level of asking. Ask them for more. Is it going to cost you any money? No. Is it going to cost them more work? Yes, but I think they're the students. That's what they're there for, to learn more. Don't overcharge them with stuff. 
It's too much. But always keep them busy. Don't just teach and drop your laptop. Have them build on it. Remember, this is also very important. Because you're teaching English outside of an English-speaking country, remember this one, okay? Because you are teaching English outside of an English-speaking country, you represent English to those students. When you go to their classrooms, the moment you walk in, English arrives. The moment you leave, English leaves. But we're online now, so it's even worse. Student uh, uh, English is something abstract. It's not a garment that you put in the closet. It's a coat. So if you are not exposed to it, it goes away. It's like the phone number of a house where you lived 10 years ago, and now you don't remember it. It was your phone. So yes, keep it going. Ask them for stuff. Keep the class lingering. Can you give us some ideas for wrap up with kindergarten, please? Yes. Ask the students to, at the moment the class ends, go to their mommy or their daddy or to their maid or whomever is with them and tell them about the class, okay? And in, or at night with the book page that they were with you today, ask them tonight, go to your father, go to your mother and explain your class. Your father wants to learn English. I'm sure he does, okay? So go and this kid go, this is a moron bicycle and this is red. And whatever it is that you do, have them revive it with the parents, okay? Now, another thing they can do is have them keep a drawing file, see? So the students can draw and file, draw and file, and then eventually have them to display it and show them, you know, show you what they've done. And then you can tell their parents, see the younger the kids, the more involved the parents are. When they're in kindergarten, the parents believe that the children are the most important thing in the world. Later they forget it. Okay. By the time they're in junior high school, they don't even remember they have kids. But when they're in kindergarten, they're like, oh my God, you know, they're the ones lining up at the paper, at the, at the paper, at the stationary store to buy everything you ask for. So then you can ask the parents of kindergarten students to take pictures like after a week and, and the parents will do it for you. Uh, how can we involve students socially when they are at new when they are new when they are new at the school? Yes, well, you ask here good question. Here's what I do whenever I have a student group, because remember I do experimentation. I ask them to I ask for a picture of everything. And we play a memory game. And we say, okay, I'm going to show you a picture and you have to say who it is. And you throw in the new student and you throw in the other students. And then the new student has, is learning the other kids' names and everybody is learning his or her name. That's, I mean, there are many things you could do, but that's one of them. I'm, I'm, I'm dragging here in time, sorry. Uh, okay, how can we involve, no. Is it a good idea to assign the students what will that will participate and rotate them in each class since i have 35 students i feel for you and 45 minutes yes you can assign the students that will participate and i think we discussed i don't know if you attended my previous sessions but we i discussed a little bit maybe i just said it very fast yes uh not everybody is going to be seen by you but you can ask everybody there are techniques i think we did this last week in class management. There are techniques for everybody to do it, but you only focus on a few. Okay. But don't pre-assign as in tomorrow only George, Mary, and Carmen are going to work. No, because the other ones are going to say, yeah, it's not my turn. No. Tomorrow everybody is going to talk. But when you focus, you focus on George, Mary, and Carmen. Okay? Uh, what can we do with parents who are not involved? Well, have the school give them a call, or you, if the if mother superior, <laughs> poor mother superior, if the principal or the headmaster or whatever they call them in your country, uh, if they are not used to having the teachers contact the parents directly, have them call and say, warn your superiors, tell them, I have three students that are totally disregarding the whole thing, and I think we should have a word with their parents. Do you think it would be good if I call them? Is that approved, or would you rather do it yourself? 
them. So have them face the consequences because at the end, they're going to want you to respond for the results and that's not going to happen. Is it? Okay. Um, what's your opinion about Nearpod? Are we talking about that software that includes having uh, or downloading uh, pods like like uh, presentations? If that is the case, I'm not really sure if that's what you want, if that's what you're asking, but if that's what you're talking about, treat it as if it were uh, one of those tutorials that I was talking about. The only difference would be that it would be an ongoing process where your interventions would be like on the side, discussing or presenting what's there. They don't let the students go through a whole thing alone because they're not grasping. And that's probably the reason why you're asking. Okay. Now, take into consideration everything we did today. Pause, pause. Remember the first recommendation? Short segments, short segments. Even if it's a pod that you're playing, cut it. Stop and do whatever you need to do. Uh, do you think this approach applies to university students? Yes. The only difference is that when you teach as a, a, a professor, then your segments could be bigger, your information could be more condensed, and another very important thing, you can ask your students to do a lot of pre and post reading, which you cannot do with your students in regular classes. Now, if you're talking about university English courses, then it does match much more of what I said. Uh, if it's an English class that you are teaching at a college level, then you can do pretty much the same thing, just adapt everything to the mental thing. Now, one of the things, I think that was our last question. One of the things that I, when I've, I've said this in front of teachers a few times, maybe you were there. I visit a lot of countries every year, except for this one. I only went to the Middle East, I think, yeah. Um, and then the whole thing stopped. Uh, my last trip was to Dubai. I ended with a, in a big, with a big note. Okay, uh, but uh, always consider the fact that these learners need your support. Okay, so one thing that you need to consider when it comes to university, when teachers tell me, um, "Oh, oh, you teach children like." in a demeaning way, like, oh, it's not so easy. It's not. I always say, and I, I am convinced, I'm a convinced teacher that it is more difficult to teach children than grown-ups. Why do I say that? I have proof. Okay. What is my proof? The fact that when you teach, think of a train. I just bought a little train. I'll show it to you some other time. Uh, when you teach children, Think of your students being trains. The grown-up is a train that is stopped at the station. This means the grown-up is already 18 or more. The brain is stopped. It's already there. The, the abilities are there, and eventually they will stop dropping, but wait until he, he or she is 50-something or 60. But when you teach a child, the train is in movement. So it's more difficult to teach a child because the child's brain is the train, brain train. And here you are running next to the train, teaching them based on the stage that they are, based on the station where they are at that time. It's not the same thing to teach, uh, to talk about streets in the city and giving directions to a three-year-old than to a seven-year-old. Because of what a brain can do, then, that requires a certain way of doing it. Because of what a child can do when he is eight, then the topic that you're going to teach them can be taught using other elements that you could not use when the student was six. I'm sure you've heard stories like, uh, why can't I use uh, level one with uh, an 11-year-old if he has never studied English? Because of what I just said. Because the students train is already in a station that level one was not designed for. Level one was designed for a train that was in the six, seven, eight range of stations. I'm sure that that was a good analogy to explain what I want. My friends, 
I am so happy to be with you today. And I just want to say thank you. And uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. And uh, if you want this session on its in its PDF format, send me an email, mario.herrera at pearson.com. And I will, those of you that sent me that email last week, you may recall that on Thursday morning I was sending it to you. Okay. And thank you. Um, and those of you that are on Twitter, please join me on Twitter at Mario ELT. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Thank you very much. Thank you, all teachers, for being with us today. We invite you to our uh, next session. This is going to be next Wednesday, same time. And it is going to be about online assessment of learning and evaluation. Uh, don't forget that certificates will be given within two days. And we invite you to follow us on Facebook and Instagram. So thank you very much. Goodbye to all.